Good evening. My name is John Anderson. I'm the uh, past president of the University of Victoria's Retirees Association. And I'd like to welcome you to this evening's Masterminds 2021, the Zoom edition. Uh, to begin, and be, on behalf of uh, Masterminds and tonight's presenters, uh, Cecilie Benoit and Michael Jansen, I want to acknowledge the Quenjan speaking peoples on whose unceded territories the University of Victoria stands, uh, the Esquimalt, Songhees, and Uxanich nations um, with whom we share this wonderful spot on earth. The Mastermind series is an initiative uh, to promote and encourage uh, university and community, community interaction uh, by providing high quality lectures of distinguished UVic retirees. Uh, the series began in 2007. Uh, Beverly Timmons, who was a board member of the Retirees Association, and Elaine Gallagher, who was uh, the director of the Center for Aging, which is now the Institute in Aging and Lifelong Health, uh, began the Mastermind series. Uh, since that time, over the past 14 years, there's been over 60 uh, presentations, thoughtful and often thought provoking. And this evening's presentation will certainly add to that record of excellence. The Mastermind series uh, comprises four different uh, presentations in the month of April, Wednesday evenings, uh, and traditionally has been on campus. Uh, but because of the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, last year's uh, Mastermind series was actually canceled, and this year's, as you well know, uh, is on Zoom, uh, which has uh, changed things a little bit. Um, and the series itself is uh, a collaborative initiative uh, by the Retirees Association and the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health at the University of Victoria, uh, with the assistance of uh, the university's media relations and public affairs uh, group. Uh, in, in regard to the collaboration, I, I have to point out that uh, Leah Potter of the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health is uh, the, a key member of the team. In fact, she is the Zoom Meister uh, behind this evening's presentation and the other three in the series. Um, now, before we begin the presentation, it'll start in a few minutes. I thought I'd just mention something about, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, peculiarities of the Zoom format. Uh, as audience members, your audio is muted, as is your video, uh, and only our presenters uh, will be on video. Uh, the event is being recorded, and uh, the recording will be available uh, if you check uh, in a day or two on the website of the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health or the Retirees Association. Uh, we're very pleased that the, uh, that the session is going to be transcribed with closed captioning. Uh, Ali Bosley from the Island Deaf and Hard of Hearing Center will be uh, running that part of the presentation. And if you look uh, at the bottom of the screen, uh, to get the closed captions, there's a little um, button or a tab, I'm not sure what you call them these days, uh, called closed captions. If you click on that, uh, you'll see you, there's a, a, men, a little menu. One is show subtitles. If you click on that, uh, the closed captions will appear on the bottom of your screen. Uh, on on my, my machine, uh, the font size is quite small. So you can go back into the settings, I'm sorry, on the closed caption button, and it says subtitle settings. If you click on that, there's a little scale that you in, can increase the size of the print. Uh, so that's something if, if you're gonna be using closed captioning, uh, that you do have access to some uh, manipulation of the font size. Also, with the Zoom format down in the same area, you'll see a little box uh, Q&A. Uh, we are going to, after uh, Dr. Benoit's presentation, uh, have a moderated uh, question and answer session. And you can uh, enter your questions if you click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, 
And you can do that during the presentation or after it, uh, whichever is uh, more convenient. Um, now, on to the, tonight's presentation. And to introduce this evening's mastermind, Dr. Michael Jansen. Introducing me. As I, uh, John said, my name is Michael Jansen, and it's a great honor for me to briefly introduce Cecilia Benoit to you. She is, of course, an expert on work, and importantly, the difference between our, what our society thinks is work and not work. Overlapping her interest in work is her interest in inequality in health. Starting her research career working with midwives, she has also done research with indigenous people, street and wild youth, people who use substances, and commercial sex workers. Cecilia is originally from the west coast of Newfoundland and identified with her indigenous Mi'kmaq, her French, and her English ancestry. Thankfully, she moved to the west coast of Canada and spent almost her entire academic career at the University of Victoria. She has published about 20 books, over 100 academic articles, and held over $10 million in research grants. Um, she's getting embarrassed, I see there now. After a very successful career as a professor in the Department of Sociology at UVic, she retired in 2017. Since then, she has had a position at the Canadian Institute of Substance Use Research. She has published an academic article every second month and every second year she has published a book and won, won a prestigious award including the Killam Prize from the Canadian Council. And as if that's not enough, since retiring she has also managed to produce two grandchildren and I can personally vote for her constantly winning the prize for outstanding grandmother, mother and partner in my household. Finally, I just want to point out that it's a little ironic that Cecilia started her career studying midwifery, an occupation that was in many instances illegal but became legal, and is now one of the world's leading experts on commercial sex work, work that used to be legal in Canada and has recently become illegal. So please give Cecilia a warm welcome, and I'll go and watch Cecilia's live performance in our living room. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I really appreciate um, your introduction. So I'm just going to start my PowerPoint uh, sl slide, and uh, and then I'll. I forgot that I have to share my screen. One second. Great, thank you. Uh, so I, um, I just wanted to start by acknowledging both uh, John and Leah for their uh, wonderful organization of this series and to thank Michael for introducing uh, me. I'm not sure if it's obvious to you, but he's my husband as well and co-researcher for many, many years. Uh, so thank you very much for the introduction, Michael. I also wanted to just acknowledge that my research has, uh, has been possible through the the help and the intellectual stimulation from a, a lot of other researchers, both here in Canada, the US and England, and also New Zealand. Uh, funders uh, from uh, CIHR, the, the Trudeau Foundation, as well as from uh, SHRC, the Social Science and Humanities Council of Canada. And I and also wanted to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, both at UVic and at, the, um, at CSER, uh, where I'm now currently located. And most of all, or finally, I should say, I wanted just to thank the you know, 1,400 or so sex workers that I've interviewed with my colleagues over the years, as well as the 20 or so support organizations in Canada and uh, in New Zealand that uh, have worked with us uh, and helped make this research possible. So the outline for my talk today, uh, this evening, is to, I want to locate uh, my research on sex work. Uh, none of us begin a particular topic of uh, research. It doesn't just come out of thin air. There's, a, there's usually a, a reason behind it, a context that, uh, that I'd like to share tonight. I'm going to talk a bit about the debate over sex trafficking and prostitution, which, um, which is a very, very uh, serious and uh, difficult debate. 
that's currently underway in, across the globe. I'll talk about Canada's criminal code laws, also about our research on sex work in Canada, and then some recommendations for going forward. So as Michael alluded to, I, I've been involved in a lot of policy debates across my career. And in fact, as a, as a, a young graduate student, um, my research was uh, very much focused on gender. Uh, and in particular, was um, found myself in, when I was doing my PhD in the middle of what was then the midwifery and maternity care movement. And in some ways, this seemed to be very gendered uh, um, debate, a very gendered um, kind of discourse. Um, so I was very much involved in, in questioning whether midwifery should indeed be a legal uh, occupation in Canada and whether their midwife services should be actually funded by the public purse. And so it's, it's, it's so interesting in, in a quarter, 25 years, that this actually has become the case in a number of regions of Canada, of course, not, uh, not everywhere. But today in Victoria, for example, about one third of um, families have midwives as their care, primary caregiver and it's funded uh, through our healthcare system. I also was very interested in uh, uh, working with Indigenous colleagues, especially Dina Carroll, on, on questioning whether Indigenous knowledge, maternity care, midwifery knowledge that was in place long before settlers came to Canada, should that be part of today's midwifery uh, training? And uh, and um, so that and their race and gender were kind of categories that seemed to stand out and uh, and, and and indeed that has been the, it is the case in some places but uh, but definitely not across Canada. I also did research on care work in Canada. A lot of the work that uh, actually was outside of the formal economy and asking the question about whether it should be socially and economically valued. And we see with the COVID pandemic how how a lot of work is still very much undervalued and the care workers uh, predominantly, you know, poor uh, racial minorities, uh, um, not valued for the work they do. Along with Michael and others, I've been involved in uh, investigation of a longitudinal study on uh, street involved youth and, and asking the question about whether they should be supported as they transition into adulthood. And this problem remains, uh, major problem even today, you know, uh, about um, youth who are marginalized, youth who are, um, who are struggling with mental illness and, and how they should be supported as they move into adulthood. And then I have done research on pregnant women who use substances and uh, was, was involved with a group here in Victoria to try to provide a, a care, a one-stop shop for pregnant women. Uh, who are challenged with substance, but also for poverty and many other um, factors. And uh, the Her Way Home program in Victoria is something that we, we have worked to, uh, to help establish. And then finally, uh, the, the work I'm going to talk about tonight really is about sex work. Uh, should it be decriminalized and should it be uh, sex workers be integrated in the Canadian economy and society? So how do I, did I get involved in doing research on, uh, on sex work? Uh, I have never been a sex worker. Um, before 1998, I, I really knew very little about how, how um, um, I, had, I shared all the prejudice of the dominant society, but I knew very little about um, what, um, what, we, what the industry looked like, who was involved and so on. So I had an invitation once from uh, from the community by Piers Victoria, which is a Piers Resor um, Resource Society, which has has celebrated over you know 20, 25 years of service here in Victoria. I was invited by them to help them um, get a community grant, and they didn't know what research question they should ask. And so Michael and I thought uh, that they were thinking about that we should focus on how to get people to leave sex work exit and um, and we uh, thought about this and we thought well why don't we try and figure out who is involved what what are their characteristics what is their health status and uh, what are the challenges they face in in life and so um, we got the grant and then they asked me to help them with the research and and uh, we produced a report within a whole year we did 201 interviews and we produced a, a report that uh, 
was uh, has been very it's just great literature, but it was very very useful in helping um, on a variety of ways to, to actually shed light research angle or the idea of doing empirical work on the sex industry. Um, some of this research was used later on as evidence for the Supreme Court challenge to Canada's prostitution laws, along with other research. And also um, our colleague Gillian Abel in New Zealand used the same strategy to study the sex industry in New Zealand. And then it was subsequently decriminalized in that country, one of the few countries in the world that has decriminalized sex work. So if we think about um, this, uh, this, this topic, commercial sex or prostitution, it is very divided uh, among feminists in particular, but also uh, uh, others as well. And you see the, the range of topics uh, on these titles of these books. Um, uh, it's uh, it's uh, really, really um, a heated debate and very difficult to, uh, to, to think about empirically because of the emotions that are involved in it. My, the way I see uh, how this, is, uh, this, this topic is, uh, is handled is that there's a debate about what the problem is. Is the problem uh, uh, is pr uh, uh, primarily one of gender? Is it hierarchical gender relations where, where um, prostitution equals sexual, sexual exploitation? And now the more recent lingo is sex trafficking of women by men, is it, is, it, is, it that, is that the primary problem, that particular uh, unequal relation? Or is prostitution a form of work? Can it be seen as sex work, which uh, like a lot of other service work in capitalist societies involves multiple forms of social inequality and these intersect uh, in the economy. So those are the two primary positions, I think on the, on the grid, the, academic and popular debate about prostitution and inequality. The context, the global context is that human trafficking is a major problem um, uh, in Canada and many other countries. Um, uh, there's been lots of documentation written on it and lots of uh, legislation to try to attempt to deal with it. And then it involves certain acts and certain means and then the purpose is um, is to exploit individuals, individuals who are vulnerable because of their labor or service, and uh, and and they become threatened, um, and uh, and their safety is is um, undermined. The uh, ILO, their International Labor Organization data, talks about the different types of human trafficking, sort of trying to put some empirical lens on it, and you see here that uh, forced labor exploitation, uh, it's about, you know, two thirds or uh, of, of, the, um, of the exploitation of, the, of human trafficking that takes place. So this is important to keep in mind because um, when, when the talk is about trafficking, the focus is on sexual trafficking, but actually forced labor is by far the major form of exploitation that takes place in capitalist societies. There's also a, a state imposed forced labor about 10% and then forced sexual exploitation is over 20%. So this is the kind of the, the, re, the, the, the variation within human trafficking and then the extent of it. And some of these, these data are, are presented in other studies as well with slightly different uh, percentages. Canada has done, um, uh, made a lot of efforts to combat human in the last uh, years, I've been involved in some of the um, some of the the studies, and um, there have been two recent reports that Canada has uh, produced: uh, human trafficking uh, consultation report, and then more recently, into into a national strategy to combat human trafficking. So it has a five-year strategy. Uh, it's called focus on. Uh, the key messages are all of the government approach, uh, supporting organizations to help victims of human trafficking. And it's an interesting report because it really tries to separate um, uh, uh, sex trafficking, human trafficking, sex trafficking, and volunteer prostitution or sex work or commercial sex, as we could use those terms. So 
a lot of sex worker organizations were interviewed, uh, a lot of people who are, um, are um, you know, focused on the, the gendered nature, nature of uh, sex trafficking as well. And the government's report has tried to balance these, these perspectives. So, uh, so to try and avoid the conflating these, uh, these issues and to think about them, yeah, about um, something about prostitution can also be voluntary. Now, that's uh, the question, the, what's going on in relationship to human trafficking. Canada also, apart from its, its human trafficking laws and so on, uh, which are embedded in the criminal code, it also has a long history of criminalizing prostitution. So historically, the selling and buying of sexual services between uh, consenting adults wasn't a crime, but various aspects of it were. So you could, you could buy and sell, but almost everything else about uh, the exchange was um, criminalized. So you can see here the procuring or living on the avails of prostitution, owning or operating um, a house or a place uh, where uh, sex work took place, uh, communicating in public for the purpose of prostitution, and then bringing somebody or trans somebody to um, um, a sex work establishment. All of these were criminalized. Uh, uh, until uh, recently. So in these laws um, in Canada are largely similar to ones in Britain um, and have been challenged in both Australia and in New Zealand, uh, in parts of Australia and, and of all of New Zealand, but they still remain in place in, uh, in many other former um, colonies of Britain. Now, in 2013, um, the sex work laws in Canada were deemed unconstitutional. So there was um, uh, a challenge to the criminal code in, back in, uh, in, at the provincial level in 2011. And, um, and then it was upheld by the Supreme Court in 2013. So the laws were seen to violate sex, sex workers' rights under the charter, the rights to life, liberty, and security, as a per of person and also freedom of expression. And as you can see here, what the former Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin's uh, opinion that the par parliament has the power to regulate against nuisances, but not at the cost of the health, safety and lives of prostitutes, which is a term that's often used in the law. What's, what I think is very, very interesting here is that um, the, 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 the the, the case, these cases that, uh, that uh, ended up in the Supreme Court, it very much weighed the kind of empirical evidence pro and con uh, against what, whether to change the, the prostitution laws. And it, and it found that the social science evidence um, was actually stronger. And so uh, it, it, um, the, um, the, the, the judge decided um, that the laws in place were actually harmful to the sex workers. They made it more less safe for them, more difficult for them to live. The, the Supreme Court, they, the ruling gave uh, the government at the time one year to make a decision on whether to come up with a new criminal law or whether to actually decriminalize sex work and to regulate it uh, as we would do uh, with other service jobs in the economy. Uh, the uh, conservative government in 2014 came up with a new prostitution law uh, called the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act. So this is the first time in um, Canadian history, as Michael uh, alluded to, that we have the criminalization of the purchase of services. So anywhere at any time, um, uh, somebody who attempts to purchase or even communicate about the purchase of sexual services is, commits a crime in Canada. It also criminalizes receiving material benefits from prostitution and procuring service. So this could be the case even when a, a sex worker helps another sex worker set up their website or to, uh, to teach them uh, various things about uh, how to protect themselves and so on, that, that uh, they could be seen as breaking the law. It also makes almost all advertising for sexual services, someone else's sexual services to be illegal. 
and it's also illegal to uh, for sex workers as well as clients or, or potential clients to communicate in the public near a school ground, playground, or daycare center. So we have one of the um, well, strongest criminal code laws uh, around the world now, um, at least the um, in the social democracies uh, in relation to prostitution. Now, not sure if this is going to work. I'm hoping it will. I just wanted to show you how uh, um, one way of trying to understand this law. Pardon me? I'm not sure if you uh, were able to hear that. Um, apologize if it wasn't. So it was trying to explain one aspect of the um, of the criminal code uh, law. And uh, here I just wanted to show you what the former Justice Minister McKay said about uh, his view, uh, or he thought Canadians' view on prostitution. He said as a very dehumanizing phenomena, that's inherently exploitative form of discrimination against women and children. So here we are at that notion of uh, that sex work or prostitution equals, you know, the gender exploitation of women and children. So that's uh, um, an overview of the debate of the difficulties um, in, um, that sex workers in Canada face, both uh, in uh, relationship to you, to uh, the trafficking debate, and also in regard to criminal code laws around. Um, um, in relationship to prostitution. And I'll get back to that at the very end. But I wanted to share um, um, some of the uh, work that we've been doing, um, apart from the early research that we've been doing, we've doing a number of subsequent studies, but we did a very large study uh, across Canada in 2013-14. We're looking at the key factors linked to exploitation or freedom in the Canadian sex industry and what policies and practice to both promote safety and health and healthcare for sex workers and those they interact with. We were in um, Newfoundland, Quebec, and Alberta, Ontario, Alberta, and uh, BC. And uh, we, um, I focused uh, mainly on the, the sex worker uh, project, which I'll talk about tonight, but there were other projects, as you see, that were also um, going on to uh, in this study. We wanted to have some clear definitions of what uh, what the main uh, um, uh, the main uh, people we were focusing on our study. We asked standard questions that you would ask the Canadian population. We wanted to look at the industry in a three hundred and sixty degree uh, angle lens. 
we have multiple cities because context does that. And um, we also uh, had diverse um, research team members, uh, people from uh, uh, the academic of partners and trainees, but also knowledge users and collaborators from uh, who worked with us all the way through the project. So if we could find uh, sex work because we were interested in health, safety, um, and uh, and well-being. We looked at the exchange of sexual services for money uh, that involved direct physical uh, sex work. We were we were less cons uh, interested in in um, virtual sexual exchanges that are become more common. We are interested in adults who were involved in sex work, and we were interested in understanding what regularly involved in the in sex work with uh, what the experiences would be of people. So we interviewed 218 sex workers in, a, in 2013 and uh, we recently did a follow-up study here in Victoria after those new prostitution laws. So this is how compared to other Canadians. Um, you know about uh, three quarters of, uh, of them um, uh, identify as women. 17% uh, identify as men and then 7% as um, trans workers and you can see the Canadian population numbers there. They're younger than the average, mean average age of the Canadian population, much more likely to be, to be Indigenous and less likely to be a visible minority, less likely to have finished high school or own their own home, but their annual personal income is higher. So, um, and I keep that in mind for one of the motivations why people uh, are involved in sex work. So here's uh, some comparative data with other um, um, service, um, personal service workers in, in, in Canada. And you'll, you'll see here that uh, the nurses aides are a little bit older. Um, gender breakdown is a little bit higher for hairstylists and, and nurses aides. Uh, sex workers are less likely to have completed uh, high school, but their income is uh, higher than all of the other occupations listed here. We also asked them how their job compared to, uh, to other jobs that they may be doing now or not doing. And you know, we think about sex work as precarious labor. They are often in job, uh, done, doing two or three jobs in order to make a living. So we wanted to know what keeps you in sex work, sex work what are the things that you like about it to compare to your other jobs and what are the bad things or things that you don't like about it. So these were their other precarious jobs, uh, serving, food prep, cashier, like, like cleaning, home care and so on. Um, and there's a big debate about, you know, good and bad jobs in Canada. And most of these jobs would be seen as, as bad or precarious because of the low, um, low, income people make and the lack of control over their working conditions and so forth and then often not not a full-time job so when we asked the pros and cons of sex workers they actually had higher job satisfaction in their sex work they made more money um they felt they had more work control the worst uh, or they didn't their work control was, was about the same but the problem main problem for them was the stigma attached to uh to sex work. This is what I want to present a little bit now on, on this whole notion of stigma. Um, just before our talk, talk, I heard today about the importance of, uh, of uh, stigma being a barrier for uh, young people uh, accessing care when they have drug overdose. And uh, last year I was involved in, in the uh, Chief Public Health Officer's report on stigma um, as a major um, problem in our healthcare system. So stigma is also uh, a, a major cause of social inequality. So beyond race and gender uh, and social class, uh, stigma actually um, can make people poor, can make people excluded and marginalized, and, uh, and it can also lead to death. So lots of groups are stigmatized in our society, uh, often the most marginalized, um, and sex workers are, are one of those groups. So stigma works uh, like this. It's a cultural designation of, um, of uh, devalue. People become concerned because people are judging them and then they tend to hide away or to avoid others and, and often it leads to lower self-esteem. 
for sex work, they deal with three types of taint, if you like, or three types of uh, problems, both the physical, social, and moral. So physical taint is often linked to public health. And now we're dealing, you know, now with a, a, an epidemic or a pandemic. So we know that in, in earlier times, uh, sex workers are often linked to uh, um, venereal diseases or to other kinds of, and then when the AIDS epidemic was rampant, sex workers were connected uh, to that um, epidemic as well. We also get this social taint because sex workers are often conflated uh, with, as drug users and they often seen as one and the same. Um, and then finally, the moral taint of conservative values. So we have, um, this is what Peter McKay uh, said about people who uh, buy sexual services, uh, the predators and perverts, those who consumers of this degrading practice. So very, very um, conservative uh, view of, uh, of, um, of people who buy sexual services. And we see that about in relationship to other causes in Canadian society, whether it's sex education or abortion or, um, or other such controversial issues. So we tried to measure um, stigma in relationship is called uh, the scale is called the perceived devaluation and discrimination scale. We're interested in seeing what sex workers, whether they felt that they were stigmatized. And we asked them this series of questions, whether most people would accept a sex worker as a teacher of young children. Most people think less of a person working in the sex industry. And there, were, there was a whole series of these questions and whether people would be reluctant to date them if they knew they were working in the sex industry. And what we found was a very uh, high level of perceived stigma among, um, among sex workers. So uh, the, the top group were, these, were, these were some other studies I was involved in or others as well. So we used the same, same measurement, the same tool. And people who provide services to sex workers also felt stigma by kind of, we call it courtesy stigma or stigma by association. Legally blind people, um, this is a study that we did here in Victoria, also feel um, stig stigmatized because of their disability. And then people with mental illness, much higher level of uh, stigma, but sex workers, um, you know, almost a universally high level of stigma um, perceived stigma because of what they do for a living. And um, so then I wanted to just talk a little here about um, the, the way the Canadian laws are now organized and this uh, way we marginalize or exclude sex workers from Canada, as well as that, you know, that strong stigma attached to them. This is actually um, just worsen during the uh, during the last year and a year and a, almost a year and a quarter now, so what we find is that the social inequality sex workers face, the marginalization before is is actually exasperated uh, with COVID. So they have very few of them been able to get benefits that other Canadians have been able to um, to get. The, their work is not legitimized. They don't have. They're not seen as having a legitimate occupation. Many don't have a SIN number and are reluctant to apply for one because they don't want it, uh, the government to find out about what they do. Um, they often are paid in cash for their sex work and thus cannot show um, the annual income to qualify for EI or CURB. Many are independent contractors rather than employees, and so it's not that easy to, um, to get uh, access to those benefits. And many haven't filed their taxes because, again, of the fear of exposure, either because of the disability or migrant status or further stigmatization. I should tell you that uh, disability um, um, among the study, uh, about one third of sex workers uh, have um, uh, a disability. So uh, we're talking here again on another dimension of marginalization. So many of them uh, were not able to get um, or if they applied uh, for CURB, then they lost on their disability uh, benefits. So where are we now? Just, uh, just two weeks ago, um, an alliance of 25 um, sex work organizations in Canada have now are taking the government to uh, court to, to challenge Canada's uh, uh, prostitution laws. Uh, 
the Trudeau government actually supported um, um, or, or did not support the, uh, the last uh, a law, the 2014 law, nor did the, uh, the uh, NDP, they both, and the Trudeau uh, government promised to actually change the law when it got in power, but um, it, uh, it actually has done nothing. And there was a five year, um, um, the Supreme Court had put a five year um, um, requirement that uh, the, the new law be uh, studied um, and uh, Trudeau government have not, has not done that so far. So this Canadian Alliance for Sex Work law reform has decided to actually um, uh, move for uh, change in, uh, in Canada's um, current prostitution law. So a lot of expense, a lot of money, a lot of time now being taken up to uh, try to uh, challenge the law. The law is already turned twice in uh, provincial courts. Um, it seemed to to um, to not uh, it's not upholding the charter rights of sex workers, so it may well not do so in the Supreme Court challenge as well. So takeaway messages really um, uh, from the research I've done and the thoughts I've put into this. Um, social problem over all these years, I would say commercial sex or another term is prostitution, is a problem really of social inequality. It's a problem of marginalized people trying to make a living in Canadian society. Um, they're more likely to be uh, to identify as women, but also more likely to identify as Indigenous, uh, also um, more likely uh, to have very little or very few economic assets have low education and uh, and are make ends meet by working in a variety of uh, different jobs, uh, and one of them often is commercial sex. So rather than having the punitive laws that we have in place, uh, I would recommend that we have policies that create more choices for people in sex work. So rather than punishing people, you know, build on their capabilities uh, um, to uh, to give them more opportunities, more choices, either in sex work or in, in any other uh, occupation that uh, they are able to uh, to work in. Uh, so, and and the first, um, you know, the, the thing to do is to actually make uh, it it um, a legitimate job. Let them be able to have access to occupational health and safety policies. But to be regulated uh, like, like other service jobs, whether it's home care, whether it's food and ser uh, beverage service, um, and, uh, and, and let that be possible. Because we must remember that sexual exploitation takes place across lots of occupations, but what we, what we find ourselves with sex work is it's seen as only sexual exploitation rather than possibility that actually it's a, an economic generation that generating activity and could involve um, exploitation uh, as, as we, we see in other lines of work. So given sex workers access to occupational health and safety is important. Taking some action around poverty reduction is extremely important. So we are a lot of debate right now on the universal basic income. That would go a you know, a, a long way to helping people like uh, a lot of the sex workers that we've been interviewing uh, to be able to afford their housing, to be able to avoid, you know, afford childcare, to be able to, to be able to um, afford, you know, to, to uh, have, um, um, meet their material needs. Uh, and then supports again, you know, building on their capabilities for education, childcare, housing, uh, and we can think of other supports as well. That would be that would be very very important. As we as we know, we need to do with other marginalized groups in Canadian society. Um, we really need to try and think about ways to changing stigma, changing the way that we see people who uh, sell sexual services. We have um, uh, very few tools on how to do that. We have very few tools on how to change stigma attached to other uh, groups as well, who um, I alluded to earlier. So we need to think about ways, education is one way, but uh, often, uh, often the message doesn't get, doesn't register uh, 
in the dominant group. So when you think about strategies and test them, measure them, and see which ones work, and uh, and and really uh, try to um, to stop uh, excluding people in society for various aspects uh, um, of what they look like or what they do, um, and uh, and yeah, so that's really important. And also, I think we need to have. Uh, stable funding for sex worker organizations and other organizations. Uh, the government in its human um, in its human trafficking strategy has put a lot of money into uh, helping uh, victims of human trafficking, but it has put no money into helping uh, sex worker organizations provide services uh, to sex workers. And during the pandemic, sex worker organizations have been fundraising and doing all kinds of things in order to provide services and, and just basically get money into sex workers' hands. So there's very little help in Canadian society to, uh, to fund these organizations, which really are community-based. They're very much driven uh, and they're very much in contact with, the, with, the pe with people on the ground. So my last words, um, I don't know of anybody, how many of you have read the, um, uh, the um, missing um, Indigenous women's inquiry, but uh, reclaiming power in place. There's a there's a, a big discussion um, about sex work and sex workers in in the uh, in the in the volumes, and um, what you know there were there was a lot of evidence for people for if for and against sex work. Uh, uh, the debate that I talked about tonight was is very much played out in this. Uh, in this report, but there are a number of recommendations uh, that are quite close to uh, what I think um, you know we should do, and and I just have uh, this is the one one of them that I that I selected, um, and the focus for, for the for the um, reclaiming power in place is on Indigenous women and girls, and also people with other sexual identities uh, who are involved in sex work. And really, again, the same message is how can we, in Canadian society, promote their safety and their security? And we have to do, we have to develop new programs, new strategies that actually are designed and delivered in partnership with the people uh, with lived experience in sex work. So uh, it's really important that um, we see that with uh, with people who uh, have other uh, challenges, uh, whether people who are um, who have uh, uh, who have substance use problems and so on, we have to work with the people on the ground. You have to find out what what their needs are and what they think needs to be done. What strategies do they have in place to uh, to empower uh, themselves and people with other experience uh, like themselves? So I wanted to uh, lead you, uh, leave you with that um, thought. So thank you very much. Um, I look forward to your questions. And this is my contact information. And all of our research is published on, the, on that website, understandingsexwork.ca, so that it's publicly accessible to everybody. Um, so thank you. Oh, thank you, Cecile. That was that was the most enlightening presentation on an area which I'm sure many people are are not aware of, uh, other than you know just kind of general stereotypes and uh, movie images. So thank you very much. Uh, to begin the questions, um, uh, one one is: Were all the workers you've studied female? No, uh, um, as I said, about 75% or so, uh, 75, 77%. So the rest identified as we call cis men or as, as men and then, uh, or as uh, trans, transgender people. So uh, not all people in the sex industry are women or identify as women. Uh, and I think we've seen that way back in the early Victoria study that I, we conducted back in, in uh, early 2000. Um, that again, that's a, a kind of a common assumption, but actually, it's not the reality. Yeah. So, like your sample of uh, 
individuals would be representative more or less of the population? No, it wouldn't be representative to the population. So it's overrepresented by women, um, but, uh, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, a, a 75% are women and the rest identify as either male, men or as transgender. So it's, uh, it's probably similar to some, some other, my other service jobs where women predominate, like perhaps, I'm not sure what the breakdown in nursing is now, but you know, it means some yeah. other occupations, something yeah. like that, where women traditionally uh, were more, more likely to be involved. And, uh, but increasingly in, um, in sex work, we see more, more uh, cis men and more trans people uh, becoming involved. Again, as a, as a way to make a living. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another question was, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, fairly high proportion, seemed like a fairly high proportion of disabilities. What kinds of disabilities were found? Um, in our question, we asked uh, the uh, question that we, uh, the Canadian government asked the community health survey. So uh, we didn't really break it down into, I mean, I, I, I haven't myself broken down to all the disabilities people have. Yeah. Uh, so it, mental health for sure is one of them, um, but also people with uh, disabilities because of um, an occupational health and uh, an occupational hazard. Yeah. Uh, so a whole variety of, uh, of different disabilities and a large portion of them would be on disability um, benefits, uh, and then they would supplement with sex work. Yeah. Well, would, would there be like uh, substance abuse issues as well? Yeah, substance use. Uh, we've done comparative studies with sex work and um, some other occupations, and uh, for example, food and beverage, and uh, people work in food and beverage, and people work in sex work, and what we see that. Uh, People in food and beverage are more likely to use uh, more what you would call um, uh, acceptable drug, uh, drugs or acceptable yeah. um, um, uh, substances and sex workers less acceptable ones. Like alcohol is not a major problem in sex work. It would be for food and beverage workers. So we do see some, but it's still a minority. It's not a major, it's not the major, a major problem. Yeah. Yeah. Just to change pace. Uh, in, in terms of, uh, you were talking about like uh, income and taxation and access to benefits and so on. Uh, question is, can they not declare themselves as having a business? And then there are lots of deductions for exp expenses, use of home, travel costs. Uh, a new category would be needed uh, in the list of business as it's presently described. Um, some of them are able to do that, but it's very tricky. Because if you're seeing as operating a sex work business, and then if you have clients coming into you, into your establishment, then they can be charged. So, because uh, yeah. that's the way. Yeah. So it's 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 as if you're running a business, but your customers are 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 illegal. So it would be very very difficult. And also, um, landlords are reluctant to to rent to uh, uh, business establishments to sex workers because they also could be charged. You know, so uh, so it's a, it's it's really difficult uh, to do it legitimately. Um, you know, so some sex workers do um, do uh, have uh, file their taxes so on and say that they're escorts, uh, but they don't. And but but again, it's you know it's hard to do because it, different there's some different angles of the law that can can trap you. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question, uh, with this legal challenge uh, that's being uh, filed, uh, what group is involved and what, what's the current status of that uh, challenge? Well, it, as I said, it just just was launched. Uh, so I've been requested for, for research information to support the challenge and lots of other people as well. They do have uh, the president of two other lower court um, successes in challenging the criminal code. Uh, and uh, one of the lawyers that was involved earlier on is also involved in this new challenge. And so I think in the next year or so, is this going to play out? Um, so really hasn't, uh, and, and who's leading it really, it's, the, it's, it's almost every sex worker organization across Canada. So it would be peers here in Victoria, you know, there are a number of these organizations in Vancouver, in, in Montreal, Toronto, all, and, right, and St. John's, Newfoundland, all the way through. So they're all involved in this alliance and they yeah. are challenging. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned New Zealand. Um, 
What does the New Zealand law offer to protect or support sex workers? Yeah, so what happened in New Zealand is back in 2003, so they had a, a study uh, similar to the ones, some of the, uh, the one I've presented on here, and to, to uh, get a um, get a um, landscape view of what sex work looked like in the country, and then um, what were the challenges, what were the health and uh, challenges and uh, relationships with police and so on. And, um, and then there was a debate in Parliament, so it was a... Uh, um, a, a bill to actually decriminalize it. So to take sex work out of the criminal code and to actually regulate it in Canada, in the New Zealand society. Um, it passed very narrowly, very narrowly, and, but it was decriminalized in 2003 and has been since. So right now, sex workers in, uh, in New Zealand can uh, work as uh, like, other, like other workers. Uh, they, can, they are protected by, um, it was basically regulated by uh, occupational health and safety rules and regulations. They have access to um, to um, the normal complaint systems or, that are available to other workers in society, and they can file their file their income tax. They can have benefits and all of those other things. And what we have seen uh, in New Zealand, there's been a decrease, not an elimination, but a decrease in stigma related to sex work, and. Um, very much improve relationships with the police. So I didn't really present on those tonight, but sex workers' relationships to the police are, are not good. Uh, sex workers often feel discriminated by the police and they feel the police are not there to protect them. So that, that has improved enormously um, in New Zealand. You know, even though uh, stigma still exists, it's not to the same extent in the relationships with the uh, health, health uh, care system and also with the legal system has improved. And similar reports from some of the states in Australia where uh, sex workers have also been decriminalized. So um, uh, I think, uh, I think um, overall sex workers in New Zealand are, um, are, um, have um, a better uh, situation than compare to sex workers in Canada and many other places around the world. Well, how many years has that law been in, in place? Since 2003. Okay. So a long time, and there has no been not been any movement to change it, actually. Oh. Well, in Canada, we have a more roller coaster kind of situation going on. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Well, there's another question uh, uh, from a participant that was concerned about the low-paying service jobs uh, you mentioned in your slides. How big a motivator is the income or extra income earned? Uh, for this group or highly stigmatized workers? Um, it's for, for sure the main reason why people are involved. So we, we have uh, I've done other uh, research asking sex workers, why did they become involved in sex work to begin with? And, and a small portion of them were forced into it. So I won't, don't want to deny there isn't an exploitation in sex work because there, there is a small, um, a small I think it was... Uh, 10 or so percent. Uh, others had, um, um, you know, difficult early beginnings, so childhood beginnings and so on. And then some people just wanted to be involved. They thought they really liked the idea of being involved in sex work. Um, they liked the idea of, of meeting people and stuff like that. But 80 percent or so said the reason they're involved is because of the money. And the money, 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 why do other people work in jobs like why did we work because of money and and hopefully uh, other things as well so um and they can make more money in sex work than in a lot of the other jobs so um you know and then there's the downside of the stigma uh so so i think that's the main motivating factor money all because they need to pay their rent or they need to make their bills or they want to go to school and they they need money or whatever the reasons other reasons are so that's the, the main motivation factor, which I think is what motivates a lot of people in precarious jobs. It's the money that they get. Yeah. Well, with, with, with the work, is there any kind of pattern to, say, the life cycle? Uh, in other words, is someone in it for like three years and out? Or does it persist? Or is it completely like eclectic? Um, you know, I, I really, we, we need to analyze our data. We did ask people 
from the very beginning they started the sex work to their current age when you know what they did for a living so we'd be able to trace how long they were in for an amount of time and did they exit and go back i think what we do see is possible of exiting and going back. In our very first study, we've seen people, I think, exited on a, a, as many as eight times before they eventually left because they really all, they needed the money, you know, so the money was another an often reason for going back. Other reasons people who, who start later, uh, um, it's because of a divorce or some something happened and they have to return to economy and they don't have a lot of skills and so on. So sex work becomes one of their options. So, um, so there, you know, uh, the average age people in our study who got, uh, who were involved in sex work was 26. So, and then I think the average length of time they stayed was six years. So, uh, but, but how, you know, for how many times they stay in and then they exit and, and so on. And I think, again, it would be similar to we see with other precarious jobs. You know, you, you'd hope that you could move on to something else sometimes, but you can't. Or as I say, some people find it's the best way, uh, uh, the best fit for their for their life situation. So it's almost like a survival thing. Uh, I don't see it. You know, there is this idea of survival that's often mentioned. Survival sex is mentioned in the literature. I, I see it as a, a term that would be better would be constraint choice. So you have so much a cert, so much choice in your life around how to make a living. And, but it's constrained by the social context in which you find yourself in. Constrained by your, your education, your, your other experiences, the, the um, you know, um, where, uh, the, the, if you have family or whatever, and then you make the choice. So that's how I would, I, I would see it. Another question is, uh, change pace again. Uh, are escort businesses legal or illegal? And how do they kind of fit into this uh, spectrum? Yeah, well, escort uh, businesses are often, um, you know, you can get a, a, a license, um, um, in a municipal license. Um, they tend to actually charge them much more. The municipalities tend to charge escorts much more than they do for other businesses, which is interesting. Um, and not all municipalities will allow escorts to work and so on. So it, uh, and so as long as they don't um, get raided or they don't, uh, you know, they don't have what you call in-house services. So you can go out to someone else's home or hotel or something, then you, you, uh, you probably will be, will be able to operate. But with the new law, it's very, very difficult because if you're fine with a client, then that client could be charged, you know. So it's uh, um, so it's it's um, it's possible to have an es escort license and to, but you can't operate uh, an escort agency, you know. And you, you that would you would be charged because you would be um, making money off of someone else's services. Yeah. Just um, just as a final question. Um, where do you see sex work going in Canada over the next five years? And do you think it will become legal? You know, uh, if you had asked, if someone had asked me that question uh, back in 2014, I, and uh, I would have said no, um, that I don't think it's going to be legal for a long time. But I actually have changed my mind on this. And um, with the, you know, the lower court uh, successes, I actually think um, I think the the sex workers' charters rights are are being um, are being um, undermined, and uh, that I think uh, that the current law will have to be changed. Now, what the Trudeau government or other government does with uh, uh, with uh, with with uh, the, the the if they if they take away the current prostitution law, they could put something else in there that could could be equally challenging or, or, or not. But I have a feeling that uh, we're moving into a more, um, uh, a time where uh, sex worker organizations are much more powerful. I think there's a, I think it's gonna be more difficult for the government to, uh, to, to continue to criminalize uh, adult, this adult activity. Well, with that, I want to thank you once more for a most uh, thought provoking and thoughtful presentation. It's been a delightful uh, evening with you and thank you. And before we leave, I'd like to remind you that this is the second of uh, this year's Masterminds, 
Next week, we have a change of pace. Uh, Richard Keeler, uh, a professor emeritus in physics and astronomy, is going to be talking on elementary particles, the fundamental building blocks of nature. So uh, if you haven't already, please register. And I hope to see you next week. And again, Dr. Benoit, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.